I'm out of practice. Anyhow, so what I wanted to do is, as I said last time, is I wanted to really sort of intellect, uh, in introduce to you uh, the subject of uh, patents uh, and um, the, with a view towards actually doing a patent application. Um, I, I think that one of the best things that, uh, one of the most useful things that you can be aware of when you walk out of this class at the end of the semester is to be able to at least say, well, I know what a patent application is, I know what a patent is, you know, I'm not afraid of this stuff anymore. And when I invent something, I'm going to be able to protect my intellectual property rights. So I want to go over some of the history of uh, patent law. You may be sitting there going, well, this is not a history class. Why, do, why does he want to talk about the history of patent law? But I think it's uh, important to understand a little bit about the history of patent law so that you can understand the constituent elements of a patent application today. There are certain things that you have to prove to an examiner when you file your patent application, which have his important historical origins. And some of it is kind of fun, because I, you know, I love all this sort of antediluvian, you know, weird medieval stuff, which really forms the basis of a lot of our intellectual property law today. Um, so it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of a fun way of introducing um, the subject of what are the essential constituent elements of your patent application. You need to have a fundamental understanding of what you have to prove in order to have intellectual property rights uh, enforced. And a lot of those have kind of fun historical origins. Um, so anyhow, we've already talked about what a patent is. You know, it's a government license which gives the holder uh, basically a monopoly or exclusive rights over a particular invention. Um, you own it. And, and, and it's important to think about this stuff almost like... Um, uh, like a tangible thing. You know, we've talked about how intellectual property has to be in a tangible form. Well, ownership of intellectual property is the same as ownership of a tangible thing. It's the same as owning a chair. It's the same as owning a house. It's the same as owning a car. You're not really owning anything that is uh, any less real than a house made of bricks or a car made of plastic and metal. Intellectual property rights really are tangible rights, and you need to think of them as a right to a thing that exists and that you control. Um, the purpose of a patent, of course, is to exclude others from, from uh, making money, uh, exploiting, using what it is that you've, uh, your useful invention. Um, applications are handled by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Here in the United States, almost every country has a patent office where you apply for um, intellectual property rights for your device. Uh, here, um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll go over it one day, but there is a, I think I've urged you before to uh, navigate the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the USPTO website. It's really sort of a user-friendly thing. Everything now is done online with, you know, with um, electronic files. Um, in the old days, uh, the, pa the paper applications are now gone. So anyone who wants to file for a patent, file a patent application now really has to go to the United States Patent and Trademark uh, Office website and navigate it. Uh, and I think maybe one of the, what we'll do maybe next week is we'll put it up on the board and we'll actually navigate it uh, live so that you can see. You can do your, you can do your research of uh, useful art. That is, are there any other inventions like mine? Uh, you can... Uh, do all the other things that you need to do in order to uh, uh, file an application uh, all online today. Um, and by granting uh, the right to produce a new product without fear of, uh, of competition, um, you, the inventor, uh, have an incentive uh, to uh, do the research, to develop new ideas, to invest, um, and um, advance uh, uh, the state of the art, advance science, advance knowledge. Um, so in essence, um, patents and other forms of intellectual property grant uh, you a temporary monopoly on your invention. Uh, and you get to control the right to that. And by controlling the right to that, usually what we mean is exploit it financially. Uh, that's basically the idea. Um, uh, we've talked about this. Pharmaceutical companies sometimes invest hundreds of million dollars uh, in a new and a new product or a new medicine, and uh, this gives them an incentive to do that research because then they can control the distribution of that product. They can 
uh, exploit it commercially and get a return in, on investment for their shareholders uh, and um, uh, employees. Uh, source of patent law. Um, it all starts, I think I threw it up on the board, I'll probably throw it up again today, but it's, you know, Article 1, Section 8, that's the part of the Constitution that gives Congress the power to do stuff. You may have heard a little bit about it in the news recently because they're talking about what, pow what powers are granted to uh, uh, Congress, uh, what powers does Congress have exclusive right rights over, uh, and what powers does the executive have. Uh, one of the powers that Congress have that you may have read in the newspaper is to um, uh, decide what we're going to pay for. If we're going to pay for uh, whatever spending we do is controlled by Congress. Lately there's been some conflict in, in the news about uh, whether the executive can uh, overtake, uh, take over that authority. Well, one of the other authorities that Congress has is decide what is going to be protected as intellectual property. Uh, it's uh, one of those fundamental parts of uh, the Constitution. As I said before, it comes before the Bill of Rights, so somebody decided it was more important than freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, um, freedom of association. Those are all amendments, kind of like an afterthought. But the founders of the United States Constitution saw fit in Article I when describing the powers of Congress to include the right to uh, grant intellectual property rights. And Congress has done that. Uh, with this series of laws starting in 1790 up to 2011, they've revised the, basically the rules of the game, what you have to, the rules you have to follow in order to have intellectual property rights in this country. Um, the, the, the patent clause, uh, which was proposed in 1787 by James Madison and Charles Pickney, I'm sure you've heard of those folks uh, in your history books, uh, Madison wrote, the utility of the clause will scarcely be questioned. The copyright of authors has been solemnly adjudged in Great Britain to be a right of common law. The right to useful inventions seems with equal reason to belong to the inventors. The public good fully coincides in both cases with the claims of the individuals. These guys come from a history of, uh, of uh, British law which recognized copyrights and patents. And they understood that for a society to advance, knowledge must be promoted, inventions need to be protected, uh, and commercially exploited. These guys were some of the best commercial exploiters of uh, intellectual property in the world. Um, thought I'd throw up a picture of the Constitution to impress you all, knowing where it all comes from. Um, Article 1, Section 8, uh, the Patent and Copyright Clause to promote the progress of science and, the, and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. There it is, right in the Constitution, written with a quill pen. Um, some of the uh, founders of our country, Benjamin Franklin was uh, one of the most prolific inventors and he was the Elton Musk of his day. You know, the inventor of the bifocal lens, the inventor of so many products that made life easy for people. He would never, ever uh, uh, take a patent on his um, inventions. He thought that everything belonged to um, uh, the world. He uh, didn't, didn't uh, 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 ever try, take, uh, uh, or try to protect through intellectual property rights or deprive or, commit or, or, or create a monopoly of his inventions. Uh, as he says, uh, that as we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others, we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others by any inventions of ours. And this we should do freely and generously. Uh, sounds like Elton Musk, you know. Um, but of course, you know, he was pretty comfortable when he said that as well. Um, but again, it shows um, some of the uh, things that we were talking about before. Maybe Benjamin Franklin understood that uh, a rising tide raises all boats. Uh, maybe, you know, besides being an altruistic gentleman, he understood the, um, the fact that the, uh, uh, it was to his financial advantage uh, to allow uh, people to uh, exploit his inventions. After all, we're all wearing eyeglasses nowadays, uh, thanks to uh, bifocal lenses, thanks to Benjamin Franklin. So I imagine he, he sold a lot of glasses in his day by, um, by allowing others to, um, 
uh, to use that technology. Thomas Jefferson, uh, he was another gadget maker. Anyone ever been to Monticello? What a cool place it is, you know? I mean, the place is just chock full. It's like a museum of his inventions. Everything from the swivel chair uh, to the iron plow and the macro. Did you see his macaroni machine? Uh, actually, you know, you don't usually think of Thomas Jefferson and macaroni, but Thomas Jefferson came up with a macaroni machine, uh, which, by the way, um, uh, he did patent. He, he was uh, not a Benjamin Franklin slash Elton Musk. Uh, he did uh, own an awful lot of patents. Um, encryption devices, first copy machine. Um, so again, these people that wrote our Constitution were really prolific inventors themselves. And you can see, I think, how that clause got into Article 1, Section 8. So as far, far, as, far as patents are concerned, modern legislation uh, goes back to the statute of monopolies in 1624. This was kind of cool. Uh, Henry VIII, um, anybody, uh, or Henry V, I should say. Henry V was um, uh, famous for granting patents in London to all of his friends. And what you do in order to control uh, a, a piece of uh, technology is you go to Henry V and you'd kick back a bunch of dough to Henry V and he would grant you a patent. It would literally have a big seal on it, and, um, and you would be able to control that uh, technology um, ad infinitum, uh, provided, of course, that you kick back to the crown uh, a certain, a certain percentage. Um, this was abused during medieval times um, by, um, uh, by the crown in, um, in, um, in England, and eventually what it resulted in is when Parliament began to assert itself in the 17th century, they came up with this statute of monopolies, whereby they wiped the, the slate clean, eliminated all patents that had been granted by the crown. It was kind of a way of the, the of, of parliament asserting itself and thumbing its nose at the uh, royal family. So they wiped the slate clean. Nobody owned any patents. And in order to get a patent, uh, they, they instituted the first formal process for obtaining a patent. You actually had to make an application and you had to prove that your invention was, uh, was uh, useful, uh, in which case you'd be granted a patent for, back in those days, I think it was 14 years. So again, historical origins. The first time anybody actually had to file uh, an application and where there was an independent body that, uh, that reviewed them was the statute of monopolies that was granted because Henry V, in addition to having um, uh, more wives than um, uh, than he needed uh, was also uh, uh, um, corrupt when it came to the granting of intellectual property rights. And many of the things that we have today that are written in the 2011 statute, we can thank Henry the Henry V for. Um, I don't know how I did that, but. So um, more historical origins. Uh, the Greeks in 500 BC uh, re actually um, uh, recognized certain patent uh, uh, rights. Um, in England, grants in the form of letters patent were originally issued by the king. There he is, Henry V, 1413 to 1422. Um, and, um, I explained what the recipients got with those. Uh, patents were systematically granted in Venice. They were great uh, material scientists, the Venetians. The Venetians were the world's leaders in ceramics and glass and things like that. And um, the Venetians understood the, Im the commercial importance of those things. And they would grant patents uh, that were then ex exploited by the Venetians in other, uh, in, in other countries. Um, so um, all of this goes, and this is actually the, the Venetian patent statute of 1474, uh, a nice blurry version of it, by the way. So um, even the Venetians understood the importance of commercially exploiting intellectual and protecting intellectual property rights. Um, now, uh, the purpose of a patent. Um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, we've talked about, uh, invest large sums of money. So uh, the purpose of a patent for them uh, is, uh, is profit, is uh, earning money. Um, also, the development of knowledge. I mean, commercial exploitation we've talked about, 
but the other thing that uh, we've talked about, um, why does MIT own patents? Remember we talked about last week about how certain patents are more valuable than, the, than others. University patents are more valuable uh, than um, commercially owned patents. Why is that? What, what's, what, what is MIT in the business in, supposedly? Advancing the state of knowledge. So the other purpose of owning a, a patent, is, besides commercial exploitation, is to advance the state of knowledge. Develop, develop a better battery. Develop, develop a faster computer. Uh, to develop um, uh, systems and methods that uh, improve society, that do things faster and more efficiently and, and better. Um, why does this thing keep jumping around? Anybody know? Good thing I know this stuff. Anyhow, um, in, um, in Massachusetts, um, Long before the, the uh, Congress recognized patents, we were issuing patents here. Um, Samuel Winslow was granted the first patent in North America by the Massachusetts General Court. That group of politicians that meets up on Beacon Hill under the Golden Dome were, were, were the first group to issue a patent in the United States. Uh, and I think, as I told you, um, the granting of patents here in Massachusetts was... Uh, something that was done um, uh, in order to develop industries here, and we, pay, we paid bounties to uh, inventors for stealing technology from England and bringing it here to the United States so that we could exploit it commercially in the mills and in the, in, in the clothing manufacturers the, the, that sprouted up around Massachusetts. The Industrial Revolution here in Massachusetts was fueled on stolen intellectual property, which were granted rights by the Massachusetts General Court. Um, the first patent uh, issued by the United States Congress was, um, the first law was passed in 1790, and the first uh, patent was granted shortly thereafter to Samuel um, uh, Hopkins for producing um, potash, um, a method, uh, for, so a, a useful process like the Constitution says. Um, this is, in fact, um, the, this is a, a copy of the, um, of the first patent. Again, kind of blurry. Um, now, the, the Patent Act of 1790 was important because uh, it was the first manifestation of the rules that, of the game for, uh, for um, uh, inventors here in, uh, in the United States. Um, and um, uh, it, again, it informs what we're doing now here in, the, in 2019. Um, the first uh, uh, patent law uh, granted a term of 14 years. Uh, it was argued at that time that that wasn't enough. Uh, we need a longer uh, term of patents. What's the term of a patent now? 20? 20. 14 for design patents and 20 for uh, uh, utility patents. Again, um, the history of this stuff is sort of interesting because 14 years was not enough. Congress came up with 14 years and there was a lot of pushback and the, and the statute was eventually, um, was eventually amended. But the, that statute, uh, which only three years later was uh, amended again, uh, contained a, um, a, uh, a very important definition uh, of the subject of patents, uh, which uh, exists in the 2011 statute, and it states any new and useful art, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, and any new and useful improvement on any art, machine, manufacture, or composition of, of matter. Can you think of anything that doesn't fall within that definition? Um, I mean, if it's tangible, I mean, I can't think of anything really that doesn't doesn't fall within that definition, and it's and it's important. Um, it was important to Congress at the time. It was the broadest definition, again, because what they wanted to do is grant intellectual property rights on the largest uh, um, uh, uh, amount of things that they could. Again, commercial exploitation, scientific knowledge, advancement. What they're trying to do is throw a very wide net over almost everything. Um, so um, the uh, other important thing um, from the 1793 statute, which informs the 2011 statute, 
um, is that um, the um, uh, examination process uh, was um, uh, streamlined, and they dropped the clause in the older statute uh, that uh, patent inventions needed to be sufficient, useful, and important. What's the difficult word in that sentence? Who's going to decide what's important, right? Um, you can really narrow the, the amount of things that intellectual property rights uh, can protect if you say that only, it only goes to important things. And who's going to decide? So that original requirement of importance was dropped. And so now it's just new and useful. And um, also, and that's the not before known or, or used. So all it has to do now is to be useful uh, and not known before. And that's a broad definition. Um, by the way, the first abuse of patent law was also uh, here in Massachusetts. Uh, this company, Bolton & Watt, uh, which uh, patented a steam engine, uh, used to go around the country uh, waving their patent uh, in, uh, in the face of anyone that ever uh, constructed a steam engine, trying to prevent uh, or monopolize all steam engines. So this Bolton & Watt was the first company to go around and, ex and attempt to create monopolies by the use of, uh, of um, intellectual property. They had a lot of lawsuits, even back in those days, um, in order to try to control that technology. Imagine trying to con control the steam boiler technology. You know, it sounds, um, sounds really ancient. Um, we talked about Venice. I'm sorry if this, my computer keeps jumping around. I could probably unplug it and make it. This is the uh, 1718, an auto cannon. Uh, wouldn't you know, one of the first uh, inventions uh, that uh, we had here in the United States that was patented was a uh, 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 weapon of mass destruction. Um, but an awful lot of patent technology has grown out of um, Military, um, military devices, uh, which, by the way, have been exploited in other ways uh, that, um, you know, uh, uh, have been very useful to society. Um, you know, um, can anybody think of a, of a military invention that uh, we use every day here uh, not to destroy people? Well, sometimes to destroy people, but yes, what? Sure, radar for navigation. Yeah, the internet, you know. Um, so, that, you know, it's not always, and by the way, this, is, this, this invention, to be fair, was not uh, an invention by the military. This was an invention by an inventor who sold it to the military. Uh, anyhow, um, then there was the Patent Act of 1836, which created the Patent Office, which we have today. Um, and this, this act was important um, for two other reasons. It, 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 it created a library so that um, anyone who wanted to file a patent in order to demonstrate that it was new could go and look in the library and find out if anybody had ever done it before. Um, so um, uh, in, in, in the olden days, the patent office used to require you to bring in actually the device. And if you go down there today, they have shelves. I mean, warehouses full of the original patents. You'd have to bring in your thing in order to demonstrate uh, uh, that, you, that you had a protectable right. Um, the other thing that was important is they, um, they extended the, uh, the years of protection to 20 years. Uh, incrementally, first it was 14 years with an extension of seven years. Eventually, that became 20 years. And that was the Patent Act of 1836. Again sort of an evolution of how patent law uh, has gone. Uh, uh, but this is, this is where our 2011 statute comes from. Funny thing about patent law is whenever commercial, whenever times are good, um, patents are viewed favorably by society, by the courts, by Congress, by the people that establish the rules. But when times are bad, during the Depression and other economic times of upheaval, um, Patents have been disfavored. You can actually chart it like this. As commercial times, as, as times are good, patents are favored. Uh, there's an awful lot of um, uh, 
legislation written for patents, uh, patents are filed, and, and when um, times are bad economically, um, patents fall into disfavor. Back in the 1890s when the Sherman Antitrust Act was uh, enacted, it was a time of uh, great economic uh, upheaval in the United States. And the act was li literally written to prevent uh, certain monop not monopolistic uh, tendencies. Uh, back then they were called trust. Um, but what did we talk about? You remember something that we talked about where people got together in order to create a, a monopoly or to control uh, a intellectual property that had to do with patents? Remember we talked about patent groups where a number of inventors or a number of companies would get, to get, to get together that control individual pieces of technology and they would share that technology in a patent group. Um, I wager that if this was 1890, patent groups would, uh, would uh, not be favored. The Sherman Act was actually written uh, and in such a way as to prevent patent groups. The courts later on interpreted the statute differently and allowed patent groups to, um, to be formed. But the, one of the original challenges to patent groups was based upon the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, the basic um, uh, format for um, the, the present statute uh, was written in 1952. Um, and, um, that's where the new and useful, as well as non-obvious uh, requirements were written into the law. Again, what I'm trying to convey here is the constituent elements that you need to establish when you file a patent application. And the new and obvious and um, uh, the new and useful and non-obvious requirements uh, came into ex existence in 19, 1952. So, what does <coughs> Did it again. All right. So, what kinds of patents are there? There are three kinds of patents utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. A utility patent applies to new and useful processes, machines, manufacturers, com compositions of matter, or any new and useful improvement on one of these. Almost everything. Um, traditionally, utility patents have been divided into three basic types. They are mechanical, electrical, and chemical. And pharmaceutical patents fall into the category uh, of chemical patents. So utility patents really cover almost anything that can exist uh, in tangible form, as long as it's new and useful, and of course, non-obvious. Um, design patents apply to new, original, ornamental designs of an article of manufacture. So if it doesn't do anything, if it just sits there and look good, looks good, does that, is that patentable as a utility patent? Why? Exactly, it has to be new and what? Exactly. So for a design patent, it has to be new and useful. And if it ain't useful, it's not eligible for utility patents. But recognizing that there is an intellectual property value to something that just looks good because companies place a, a great stock in names and emblems, design patents are, uh, are, are also something that, um, uh, an example of intellectual property that you can obtain. But they're ornamental. Anybody give me an example of a design patent? Anyone who, who doesn't already answer all the questions, come on. Who, who can give me an example of a design patent? Somebody may be wearing a green uh, t-shirt with a logo on it. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what clothes I'm wearing when I walk out the door either. Maybe you had to look down to see what you're wearing. But the gentleman, the gentleman here, I'm sorry, what, what's your name? Kip. Kip, um, Kip um, stand up and show everybody your... Um, your logo. All right, ornamental, beautiful too. Um, an example of a design, something that would be eligible for a design patent. Yes. Ah, well, we talked about um, overlapping rights. Okay, and so this could both be. I mean, I was looking at the the leaf and the DB, and 
Does it say Mongo? You got me, man. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I probably shouldn't ask. But um, there can be overlapping protection. So for, I, I imagine somewhere um, there's a Mongo DB with a leaf um, ornament uh, someplace. There's a company with that, with that logo. Uh, so it could not only be covered by, the des by a design patent, but it could also be covered by a trademark. And if you're the owner of a company, if you're the owner of MongoDB, what do you want to do in order to protect that? Right. Why? How, lo how long does a design patent last? How long does a trademark last? Forever. That's right. Exactly. So you want to do both. And, and you know, that's what, one of the reasons why, why I go over the, the, the description of these things and what is included is because these descriptions provided by Congress are so broad that oftentimes um, uh, it can be covered by more than one form of intellectual property. And there are advantages uh, to both. If you're a computer code writer, okay, um, the electromagnetic signals that you convey code in are not patentable. But the actual code in, in, in the, in the, in, in, once it's in the computer is patentable, once it's in a tangible form. But it's also copyrightable. Okay? So, and how long does a copyright last? Oh, come on. It was only a week ago. Forever? Is it 40 years after the... Close enough. 70 years plus the life of the author. Exactly. Exactly. 40 is, is, is close enough. 70 years plus the like, life of the, uh, of the, um, of the author. Um, and if, there are more than, if there's more than one author, it's the, it's the, the, the latter. Uh, so... Um, that is a better umbrella than a patent would be. So, but oftentimes these overlapping protections are necessary. Okay, um, give you an example of a design patent. Anybody wear fancy sunglasses when they go running? You know. Um, so not only are there um, uh, utility patents for this particular type of lens, but also the the manufacturer places great stock in the way the oval shape and the way the uh, uh, frames are attached. Uh, and I just thought I'd take a picture of an actual design patent for these glasses. Is, um, I think you can see all the important parts of an application here. So you have the description, it says eyeglasses up there. And then you have the related uh, patents, so somebody who uh, did this patent application, went to the US Patent and Trademark website, looked up similar uh, devices, uh, listed all of the prior art, which you're required to do, uh, talks about the claims, the claim here, the ornamental design for eyeglasses as shown and described. All right, that's, that's the only claim, because this is an ornamental patent application. Uh, and the description, um, that's, Essentially, uh, everything that's required in, a, in an application for a, um, uh, for a design patent. And then, of course, the, uh, the actual picture of it, so that there would be no, no confusion. Do you, anyone have any idea how many um, design patents exist uh, for eyeglasses? I, I, before class, I happened to look it up. I went on Google. There are over 700. 700 separate design patents for eyeglasses or sport glasses. The, the differences uh, seem insignificant until you start looking at all the different designs out there. And it's all protectable. Um, one of the reasons why is because, you know, your company puts a lot of stock in goodwill. When they see glasses on somebody, they think of your company. They think of um, uh, your um, company philosophy, the, mi the Microsoft logo, the Apple logo. Well, glasses and other things like that are as important. The Mercedes-Benz star, the Ford uh, 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 logo, Coca-Cola, Pepsi. All of those 
things are represent goodwill that is codified in a in an intellectual property right that companies invest a lot of money in and need to protect. Plant patents are a whole separate category. Um, plant patents are generated are granted to any person who has invented or discovered and asexually reproduced any distinct and new variety of plant, including cultivated sports, mutants, hybrids, and newly found seedlings other than tuber propagated plants or plants found in uncultivated state. Okay? Why is this important? Anybody hear of Monsanto and uh, GMOs and, uh, you know, um, well, all of those are subject to plant patents. Why? Because Monsanto spends an awful lot of money um, hiring people like you to work for them to do research into new genetic forms of plants uh, that can be commercially exploited. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is one of the um, uh, ways that those intellectual property rights are protected. Um, this is, again, uh, an actual, this is a flower, but this is an actual um, plant patent um, that was uh, granted by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This is what they look like. They have a picture of the, in this case, the, um, the pretty flower. So requirements for patent protection, to obtain patent protection for a particular form of intellectual property, um, the subject matter must be accepted as patentable under the law. The U.S. and many other countries, scientific theories, mathematical methods, naturally occurring phenomenon, plants uh, or animal varieties, discovery of natural substances are not patentable. So you have to improve on nature in order for it to be patentable. If you find a non-cultivated plant and put it together with something that you have, or maybe perhaps another non-cultivated plant. So you take two non-cultivated plants and put them together. Is that something that might be patentable? Does it contain, does it satisfy the requirements? What are the requirements? New and useful. Really broad, really simple. So you take two things that, that aren't necessarily patentable, non-cultivated plants, and you put them together, you can create something that's patentable. And in fact, that's the basis of a lot of, a lot of agriculture today, a lot of medicine, a lot of chemical uh, patents are all, all created in this way. You take things that are not ordinarily patentable and put them together. Yes, sir? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Uh, and the same rules apply. Um, if, it's a, if it's a natural occurring um, uh, variety of animal, um, then no. Okay, so you can't patent a horse, right? They've been around. Horses are in the public domain. But if you genetically modify a natural occurring creature, do you think that would be patentable? The answer is yes, and I think you'd be correct. Of course, now we have CRISPR and uh, all kinds of genetic, uh, I mean, we're standing on the forefront of an entire new science where we're going to be custom designing human beings as well as custom designing our livestock and uh, animals that we use for, well, you know, dogs and show animals and things like that. So a as you improve on nature, uh, I would, in most cases, of course, it, you, know, you know the answer, it depends. But it, as you improve on nature with either a process or a method, um, it's patentable. Well, uh, it would be a utility patent uh, in many cases. It could be um, other forms of patents. Uh, animals are usually, it, it depends on what you're patenting. If it's a, if it's a uh, method for gene manipulation, it's most likely going to be a utility patent, okay? And what you really want to patent, if you come into my office and you say, I've, I've got a new way of making this dog, um, I think really what you don't want to 
what's not really that valuable is the is what it produces, but it's the method uh, for for producing it for genetic manipulation. So you want to own that method, and that would be a, a utility patent. CRISPR is a utility patent, the way for um, uh, genetically modifying human beings uh, and uh, other other um, uh, creatures. That's what you want to. That's where the intellectual property uh, value is. Why? Because we can program out diseases. Uh, we can program in intellect. Uh, what was the? Um, um, there, there's. A, I just saw a story in the news yesterday um, uh, about uh, uh, genetic, genetically modified twins in China, who may have had their intellectual. Um, uh, acuity boosted accidentally. Um, so we're getting a lot of, you know, we're standing on the forefront of a new, a new, um, a new science. But it all uh, comes under um, uh, patent protection. Um, so here's the requirement for patent protection, just so that you know, and this, is, this goes to your, your patents today. Whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process whether it happens to be genetic modifications of human beings or animals, or plants, or a better mousetrap. Uh, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter. Composition of matter, you know, gee whiz. Can you think of anything broader than that? Or any new and useful improvements thereon may obtain a patent subject to the conditions and requirements of this title. That's the statute that you're dealing with, Section 101 of the United States uh, code. Uh, so it has to be statutory, it has to be new, it has to be useful, and it has to be non-obvious. So when we file our, our application for um, a preliminary patent application, uh, because of everyone from Henry V uh, to uh, um, uh, the Congress of the United States, uh, it boils down to these four requirements. It has to be statutory, it has to be, so in other words, covered under this statute. And as far as that's concerned, can anybody think that's not anything that's not covered under this statute? If you can come up with one example of something that's not covered under this statute, I'd like to know what it is. Because what doesn't consist of a composition of matter? All right, so that's kind of a big net. So the first requirement is that it be statutory, and then it be new, we talked about that, that it be useful, uh, and it needs to be non-obvious. Useful except it, to the extent of a design patent, because we've talked about that. Um, I guess that those are useful in so far as they convey an image of some sort. All right, so we've already gone over, we've already really gone over this. The wording uh, appears in, in, in the statute to cover almost any useful invention. Um, it has the, here in the United States we have the broadest, you know, statute of anybody in the world. I don't know any country that has such a broad statute, uh, and most inventors, including those uh, uh, in the software and computer fields, don't have to worry about whether or not their inventions can be patented. In other countries, it's not so not so much. In France, in Canada, uh, it's harder to obtain intellectual property protection for things like software because they're considered electromagnetic. So, you know, here in the United States, though, um, I guess where we sort of value commercial exploitation of anything, any improvement on nature, which is really what we're talking about, um, you don't have to worry about whether or not you can get patent protection for it. So let's talk about some things that are not patentable or what is. Um, sometimes it's easier to tell what is patentable by what's not patentable. We've gone over most of this stuff, ideas, why aren't, they, why aren't ideas patentable? Come on, why aren't ideas, ideas patentable? Yes, please. Because they're not tangible, exactly. How about books, literature, and music? Are they patentable? What are the requirements? Statutory, new, useful, non-obvious? Are books, literature, and music do they satisfy those? The answer is no. What else, but what other form of intellectual property protection are those things 
eligible for? Copyright. <laughs> Think about it. A book, um, I guess you could say a book is useful as a doorstop, um, right? Uh, or a place to pile other books, I don't know. Um, but in terms of usefulness, um, it's not considered patentable. Um, literature, music, um, music is just an arrangement, a digital arrangement. When you think of what music really is, it's like a mathematical formula that's been arranged in a certain way. So that's not patentable, but it can be copyrighted. Uh, literature, words on a page. L words on a page in a certain order, probably not patentable. Uh, but um, copyrightable. About natural laws, electromagnetism, gravity, can you patent that? Nope. I see a lot of head shaking. That's correct. Uh, if you can improve on it, anybody, if anybody can improve on a natural law, I think you can patent it. Um, anybody get a better, can improve on gravity, you know? Um, now, it, this is not so silly, because when we're talking about things like electromagnetic radiation, um, and our ability to manipulate things like that. The process for, for manipulating those things in the future, especially in terms of space exploration and things like that, or, or in, in, in quantum computing, those methods would be patentable. So you, you kind of think of what quantum computing is based upon, and in many ways it's based upon physical laws. But to the extent that you can manipulate and improve on those physical laws, it, um, it, it probably is el eligible for patent. One and one plus two has been in the, one and one equals two has been in the public domain for a long time. And besides, it's, a, it's, it's basically a, a, the same as a natural law. Electromagnetism, we've talked about radio waves. Uh, radio waves themselves, you know, but we talked about radar. All right, radar is based upon radio waves. Is a radar receiver patentable? Of course it is. Although I think maybe now that may be in the public domain in a lot of ways. But if you improve on that process, it would be patentable. So the fact that it uses radio waves, the fact that it uses electromagnetism, does not make it ineligible for intellectual property protection. If your device uses those natural uh, occurring phenomenon, it's still patentable. Okay. In many ways, what it is is a step up in nature. All right. I thought you might want to see some real inventions. This is, this is a patent that was granted by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. It's a hiccup treatment. One of the reasons why I show this is to show you the low bar that you need to satisfy when it comes to inventiveness. Um, this is considered statutory, new, useful, and non-obvious. I guess the proof of, um, of usefulness is kind of in the mind of the patent examiner. I mean, I don't know that this actually cures hiccups, but um, that was the claim. Uh, and so it was granted a patent by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. If you can come up with a better hiccup treatment, you too could own a patent uh, issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. An actual patent, again, low bar, a high five machine. Actual patent. Um, I have a hard time figuring out the usefulness of this, I don't know. I guess if you have another high five machine, they can clap each other clap together, or, or I, I'm not really sure. But again, low bar, new, useful, non-obvious, OK? I guess you could say non-obvious. That's, that's the case. Um, who doesn't have a pair of these? All right? An actual patent issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office, a very detailed schematic, compliments to the artist. You know, by the way, when you do your patent application, there are people actually that draw these things. So very inexpensively, you can get someone to draw your idea. Someone did, I thought, a great job on this. I think, I think the artwork is what got it. Uh, but again, new, useful, non-obvious. You know, statutory is a given. I, I mean, it is an assembly of, 
of of matter, right? So it, it gets the it meets the statutory uh, requirement pretty easily. New, I guess. Useful, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure. All right, examples of things which are non are, are non obvious. Actually, it's getting it's getting to ten o'clock and. Before I get into this, I, I, maybe it's better to just end on a high note. Um, we, can, um, we can go over some of the non-obvious requirements. I, I think when we start our next class, it'll be more fun to go over the non-obvious requirements because then we can get right into what, um, uh, what we have to put together for a patent application. But what are the requirements for your patent application? What are the four requirements? I love you. This is perfect. Wonderful. You learned something today, right? All right. So I'll see you Friday. More breakfast on Friday. If you haven't eaten, eat something. And um, uh, look out for those uh, announcements from Brian or Professor Eager because we're gonna, it's time to focus on these, um, these, um, these papers. Um, I, I, I read all your topics. I can't wait to read every paper. They sound obvious. They really sound absolutely awesome. <laughs>